Would you guys stay standing for the reading of God's Word? And today we have a special reading of God's Word. My friend Acadia is going to come up here and help us read God's Word. Come right up. And you know what? Everyone's going to read with you. I'll hold this for you. Or you want to hold it? You like to hold it? All right, now speak right into it and read. You're a better reader even than me, so... You go. All right, help her out read with her, guys. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. The midwives replied, they are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them power. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you make the girls live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant with, and gave birth to a son. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. 
when she could no hide, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a paper's basket and card coated it with tar and pitch. Then he placed the child in it in, um, along, the, along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to kneel? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, for and I will pay you. So the mom took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Ho, ho, ho! Nice job, Acadia. Thank you very much. All right, kiddos, you guys can be dismissed. Sunday school behind us. Uh, oh, you have to do the announcements? Just hold on a second. Your Sunday school teacher has to do some announcements. You want to do it right now, Heidi? She's coming. Don't worry. I think after Miss Heidi's done with announcements, you can hang out with her for Sunday school. And then is it Miss ha Mrs. Ha Miss Hattie? Miss Hadassah is on nursery, and Eunice, awesome. Doesn't appear to be, is it working? Yep. Okay, great. Um, Nathan is actually doing most of the announcements, but I just wanted to uh, jump up and announce one last time for the women's retreat, the IF gathering. We are setting a cutoff um, date for this Wednesday, May 17th. Um, we have 25 ladies registered, which is awesome. A couple more spots open that we can uh, fit a few more. If you are interested, it's not too late. Uh, on this list, which is on the table with a bunch of other sign-up sheets there, um, if your name is not highlighted, that means that you have not registered online. Okay, so that will give you online access. And remember that you can jump on and start watching a few things if you like ahead of time, uh, two days before and two days after the weekend event. Um, you can see me after the service if you have any questions. If you guys were to catch the last announcement, I'm going to put it up there. Do they have to register? Yes. Um, I would say ethically, yes. Technically, you can show up, but um, as a host, I am in charge of making sure that all of you can register online. In the past, it had been free because of COVID and then just getting everyone out, but it is, it is um, a fee that they have um, as a business to, you know, have the speakers and keep everything going. So yes, we need to register online. Perfect. Any other quick questions about that? And then I'll turn it over to Nathan and we'll dismiss the kids. Cool, so this list will be over there. And yeah, one more thing, we are working on like lining up beds and stuff and figuring out how many. So if you've, even if you've written it on here, if you know whether you're spending the night on Friday night or not, let us know. Or if you're just gonna be um, heading back and forth. Friday night is, there will be no speakers or sessions. It is strictly just hang out, fellowship, have fun. Um, it's a great venue at Sharon Emig's house. Super thankful for her hosting us this year. Um, just specify on this whether you will be just coming for the day or what your plans are. That would be great. Thank you. And we'll dismiss the kids right now. Go ahead, kids. You can, you can leave now. Bye-bye. <laughs> I think you guys know where to go. Nursery back this way. Uh-oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. They're falling all over each other now. Go ahead, Liam. You got it. I guess you could bring that, that thing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to actually hand it over to Sharon. Sharon's going to come up uh, and share with us a little bit today. Thanks. Um, most of you are aware and have been here before that starting on Mother's Day, we start the Baby Bottle Blessing, which is a fundraiser for Haven Pregnancy Services who we support down in Plymouth. Uh, if you don't know much about Haven, um, all their services are free because they are a nonprofit. So that's pregnancy testing, parenting classes, uh, S 
let's see, it's not STD, it's STI. Uh, now they test for that free, and they do f a limited free ultrasounds just so they can uh, age the fetus for someone. Uh, and they do a lot of counseling. The ultimate goal is to obviously choose life. And so that is their main goal. So they will guide a woman and her partner through all stages of a pregnancy. There's a lot of prayer that goes into this and a lot of counseling. So because they are a nonprofit, this is another way that they um, raise funds. Uh, so something I did want to share with you that those of you who are able to go to the big fundraiser, the Haven, sorry guys, the Haven Pregnancy Banquet, they passed out these uh, little babies. So you can see that. If you'd like a closer look, you can see me afterwards. This is the actual size of a 10 to 12 week fetus. So that's the baby in utero. And I'm just going to read you a few facts about that. At week 10, the baby's fingerprints start to form. Nerve and muscle connections have tripled. Eyelids fuse together temporarily to protect the baby's delicate, developing eyes. Week 11, the baby practices breathing and facial expressions, even smiling. The baby can also urinate, and stomach muscles can contract. And at week 12, the baby is now three inches in length and weighs two ounces with fine hair on the face. The baby is able to swallow and feels and responds to skin stimulation. So unlike some people would have you believe, this is not just a mass of tissue that can be eliminated at any time. So if you'd like a closer look at that, just come see me. And then these little pins. I don't even know if you can see those. Those are the size of a fetus's feet at 10 weeks. They're real feet. That's not, you know, I mean, these aren't. This is a pen. But you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, that was gross. <laughs> uh, okay. So Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Is this still on? Okay, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So that's what we support through Haven Pregnancy Services. And it's the baby bottle blessing. It uh, always starts on Mother's Day, ends on Father's Day. Unless you're Eunice Jenkins, she brings them in the next year to give to me <laughs> with money in it. So you can put this in a prominent place, uh, fill it with change, bills, large bills, big <laughs> checks, and they can be, they're due back sort of, like I said, by Father's Day, but anytime you can drop it off here. The staff here is fantastic about holding on to these till I get them and bring them down to Haven. So, you gonna help me? <laughs> okay, who wants a baby bottle? Anyone else? A baby go. bottle? Michael? Oh, way up back. Ooh. The sheets want some? Sean, Sean, way back. We might go bowling. Oh, ricocheted off. Okay. I will also be leaving some of these here. So if you know someone that will want one, you can come into Encore, pick one up, get it to them, and tell them everything I just told you. So, and thank you, Sharon. Uh, where will the be after the service? Wherever there's room, come find Sharon. You can, Sharon, you can also leave them on the right over there. And I'd love to direct your guys' attention there. Um, if you're not already going over for the If Gathering, uh, of course, the summer church passes. Um, for those who are, are a part of Loon Mount Ministry, regular attenders is the, the language we use. Um, Loon is gracious enough to give us season passes to go up on top of the mountain. So um, there's a, the deadline for the summer mountaintop passes you'll see on your bulletins there is next week. Um, so make sure to check the list there. Um, if you've had them in the past, you'll see your name 
um, on the list and highlight your name. If your name is not on the list because you haven't um, you haven't gotten them before, um, then write your name and information in there, and we'll get you that. Um, uh, of course, a lot of people have been asking about Jim Jameson. We love Jim um, and uh, his time with us, of course. Um, his service is going to be June 10th, uh, 3.30 at the Legion, 6 p.m., and um, we would love it if uh, if our church community could just come and be there in support of, uh, of his family. And, um, yeah, it was cool because we actually got to meet a lot of them. They even came up to the Easter sunrise service, those who weren't in town, um, to connect with them. Um, the only other thing on your bulletin there you'll see is Camp Berea. Just save the date for that. Um, that's uh, August 20th through the 22nd. Um, and I, this hasn't gotten on the bulletins yet, but I just got word from Loon um, that Loon's Mountain Biking Friday Nights is actually opening a little earlier this year. And so uh, Dirt Church um, will be happening starting, I think it's June 2nd or 3rd, whatever that first weekend of June is, Friday nights up at Loon, and uh, we meet at 6 p.m. at the Kink 8, um, the Kink 8, not the lodge, but the lift, um, and then we go up from there. So if you've been a part of Dirt Church in the past, um, I'll be connecting with you guys soon. So uh, with that said, there's no kids leaving, so I think uh, Marcus is good to come on up. Right. Hi, everybody. I tell you, if you sit back here, I'm going to come back here. <laughs> Katie did an awesome job reading scripture this morning. And uh, if you were in church last week, you know, we were going through the book of James and we were covering a pretty heavy subject. And uh, I had forgotten that today was Mother's Day. So I was actually really excited this week not to be in that heavy subject anymore. Uh, we'll pick it up again next week, and then the heaviest subject will be covered by Nathan on Memorial Weekend, so make sure you come back for that service. <laughs> Nathan. Anyway, great to have you guys. It's Mother's Day. Mother's Day is awesome. And, uh, you know, some really cool things. I mean, we talk about it a lot, you know, um, Super Bowl. We go through the statistics of, like, how many pounds of guacamole, how many chips, right? Well, on Mother's Day... Beyond Christmas and beyond Easter, it is the number one day that the phone lines are tied, are tied up, right? Which you can, you can imagine that. This is the number one day for calling people. So if you have not called your mom, I would highly recommend you call your mom. I just called my mom a little bit ago, and she helped me study for my sermon a little even a bit more when I told her what I was preaching on. But Today, I want to highlight a mother that I don't know about you, but I hadn't really thought a lot about this mother in Scripture. And so when it came time for me to kind of think about my sermon this week, I started looking at the different mothers in Scripture. And what I found interesting, this is what my mom said, obviously, in the Scriptures, what's one of the first mothers that comes to everyone's mind? Mary. Exactly. Well, my mother called this mother the Mary of the Old Testament. And her name is Jochebed. Jochebed was the mother of Moses. And we know that Moses delivered the people out of Egypt, just like Jesus delivered us from our bondage of sin and shame. So you see how that correlation of Jochebed is the Mary of the Old Testament. I never thought about that. Honestly, I never really thought about Jochebed hardly at all. We all know the story of Moses really well, and maybe if you don't, I'd like to kind of pick up to help you kind of. Where did Moses come into the scriptures? Well, if you start in the beginning of the scriptures, God created the heavens and the earth, and he formed humanity in his image. But because he formed humanity in his image, humanity had a choice whether to glorify God or not. And we know, since we've had children, right, and we know ourselves, that we chose not to glorify God. We chose to glorify ourselves. And in so doing, we were removed from the perfect garden. And we went out into this desolate world, and things became very, very, very difficult. It became difficult to have kids. We heard that with the moans of the mothers this morning when I talked about a 22-month term, right? It became difficult to grow things, to harvest things. Life became difficult. The Bible says that sin entered the world by one man's decision. And so sin entered the world, and it said sin passed upon all humanity. We believe because the Scripture tells us that sin is hereditary, right? And these people from the garden went out to make a life in the world, 
And they grew and they grew and they grew in numbers because they had kids and their kids had kids and so on and so forth. Until we got to this place in Scripture called the Tower of Babel. And just like Adam and Eve were lied to by the serpent, Adam and Eve said, we will become God. We want to know the knowledge of the good and evil. We want to know what God knows. Well, fast forward in humanity, they did the same thing in Babel. They built the tower and said, we want to be God. We'll ascend into the heavens and we'll become God. Well, then what did God do? He scattered them. He made them talk all different types of languages, confused them, it says, and boom, they went. Well, they went to their different corners, and there was this one man, because God, I think, looked down from heaven and said, hmm, whew, i got to do something here. So he picked a man named Abram. We know him as Abraham. And Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, Israel. Jacob had a son named Levi. And Levi had a daughter, granddaughter, sorry, had a son named Kohath. And then Kohath had a daughter named Jochebed. Now, here's what I think is very interesting about mothers, Moses' mother. One, her name is only mentioned twice in the scriptures. Only mentioned twice in the scriptures. And Moses is a pretty prominent story. But what's interesting about it is if you look through the scriptures, Jochebed, this is beautiful, I love this. Jochebed, and I'll read it so I don't mess it up. Jochebed is the first human name that we find in the scriptures that has the divine element of Yah in her name, Jochebed. Yah comes from Yahweh. And Yahweh was such an important word. Yahweh, right, means God of the universe, God of everything, God of all. Yah, the element of Yah in Yahweh stands for glory. Glory. And Jochebed, Moses' mother, is the first human that we know of that had the divine element of Yah in her name. Now, many more came after that, but I just thought that was really, really beautiful. When God called forth Jochebed, he knew that she was going to be a very important mother. So we get to Jochebed. What happened was when... Uh, Isaac um, had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And during the time of Jacob's 12 sons, um, they went into a famine. Now, one of his sons had already been sold into slavery by his brothers. Imagine kids putting one of their siblings on Facebook Marketplace today. That's what happened. They, yeah, we could. Literally took a picture of their brother, said, free labor, free for the taking. Or even worse, pay us to take our brother, Right? So Joseph got sold into slavery, and he ended up in Egypt. And if you know the story, Joseph, through being falsely accused, was in prison, but made his way through God's providence and his faithfulness and his honesty, he made his way till second in command of one of the greatest empires ever in Egypt, right? One of the greatest civilizations, Egypt. Well, the famine drove his brothers down south into Egypt. Well, they showed up. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers didn't recognize Joseph. And Joseph had a little fun. It's kind of a fun story to read. He had a little fun. One, it was really difficult for him because he was sold into slavery. So I can imagine that being difficult. But he had a little fun too with it, which I think is great. In the end, in the end, sadly, they did not listen to the Lord and they stayed in Egypt. They weren't supposed to do that. But they stayed in Egypt, all of them. And the 12 boys had wives and children, and they had wives and children. When they first moved to Egypt, the Bible says that they are 70 in number. When they left Egypt, they were multi-millions, 400-something years later. Let me say that again. When they moved to Egypt, there was 70 in the family that moved to Egypt. But when they left Egypt 400-some-odd years later, there was multi-millions. Crazy right? Part of it was God was blessing them. If you read this story over and over again, and you saw it here, and I love part of the growing of the generations of Israel, part of the blessing of children, the blessing of the growth of a nation, the avenue which God chooses, the avenue which God chooses to grow generations and bless countries and bless peoples is what? The mother. The mother is a very, very, very important role. So let's take a look here at Jochebed, Moses' mother. 
Now, like I said, there was a Levite woman named Jochebed, meaning the son of Jacob was Levi, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, Levi. Levites ended up being the priestly line. So the Levites, the first priest was named Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother. Exactly. So Jochebed had three kids, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Okay? And so Jochebed uh, had... I, I, th- I think Miriam was the oldest, I think, if I read Scripture correctly. She was the oldest. She was pretty old, somewhere between 8 and 12, the Scriptures say, or, or, or thereabouts, when Moses was born. Somewhere in that ballpark, somewhere between 8 and 12 years old. And um, if you read through, it had been many years since Joseph had died. And now there was a new pharaoh, a new leader in the land. And this new leader came on, and his platform, when he got voted on or whatever, his, his campaign was, we're going to get rid of these Israelites because they're really annoying. But people were like, no, they're our labor. Never, things never change, do they? They were talking about cheap labor back then, and we're still trying to figure out what we're doing with labor. But this person coming into power was scared of the Israelites gaining power, joining any other country that was coming in to fight against Egypt, that this Pharaoh was like, if we don't do something about these Israelites, an opposing army will come in, the Israelites will say, it's our chance, join the opposing, opposing army and take down Egypt. Isn't it funny? Platforms are still fear based back then. This was the Pharaoh's platform. If we don't do this, something bad's gonna happen. If people are using fear, you might want to do some research, right? Including me at the front. Fear is an incredible tool to get what you want. And so this Pharaoh was using fear to strike fear in the hearts of the Egyptians. And he tried to do it with the midwives. There must have been some kind of a medical system. Why did the Israelites have Egyptian midwives? I don't really know, but it was some kind of a medical system. As you guys have all attested to with the groans, giving birth is not a cakewalk. Okay, Some things can go wrong in a hurry. And so there was midwives that knew what they were doing, and they were Egyptian. And they were given the instruction by the Pharaoh. It's interesting that you were giving that announcement today. Things don't change. This is what's interesting to me. You 55 to 75-year-olds, they're like, this is the worst world ever. It's gone to hell in a handbasket. Have you not read your Bible? (laughs) We have been broken from the day that we chose the fruit and walked out of the, the garden. The first brothers killed one of each other. Let me say that again. The first set of brothers, one killed the other with a rock in the head. That is barbaric right? Sin is sin. Whether it's 2022 or whatever the years was, this was in Egypt. And out of fear, the Pharaoh said, I want you to kill every baby boy. Sound familiar? I want you to kill every baby boy. That's what he says to the midwives. And I can imagine these midwives going back to talk to each other and they're like, are you going to do it? I don't know. Are you going to do it? And I can hear the conversation among the midwives. If we don't do this, it's our lives. We'll die. And I can imagine this pact that they made. If you don't do it, I won't do it. And if you don't do it, I won't do it. Imagine this conversation. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. This is a rough conversation that these women are having after they left the Pharaoh who said, because if you do not obey the Pharaoh, you are done. There is no questions about it. And they said, Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? And they all said, no. We are not going to do it. Right? We're not going to do it. And so these women went out and did not do this. And the Pharaoh was like, what is is this I hear? What is this I see? I hear the cries of baby boys. And I see the feet of baby boys running around. Israelite baby boys. What what is the deal? What, what What are we doing? I told you guys to to kill them. And I, I, I can see the wives, they, they were awesome. And I love this. This is so cool because they talk about the strength of a mother. <laughs> these Egyptian midwives goes, have you seen some of these Israelite women? They are bad. These chicks are giving birth before we even get there. They don't need us. They are bad women, man. They're awesome. They're, rude. They're tough. This is what they tell the Pharaoh. And so the Pharaoh does what dumb men do. He goes, well, I'll take it into my own hands. And so he starts telling his men. 
He starts telling the army. He starts telling the police force, the law enforcement, go into the slums, go into the, the, the Israelites' communities, and any boy, just huck them into the Nile River. Did you hear what I just said? Huck them into the Nile River. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have been to the Nile River. I have not either. But one time I was on a Zoom meeting. No joke. One time I was on a Zoom meeting with a missionary that we used to support in Uganda. They had a really cool soul hope. It was for kids' feet. Remember the jiggers? I was on a Zoom call, and he was on his porch that overlooked the Nile. And he was just sitting there, and it was like, you know, 90-degree day in Uganda, and it was negative five here, and I was talking to him in Uganda. And he was right in mid-conversation. He goes, oh, I got to go. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he runs off off screen. And I hear like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm just sitting there looking at a Zoom screen that doesn't have him. Well, I stay on there because I can still see the beautiful Ugandan sunset. And he comes back up, oh, so sorry, sorry. My dog got close to the Nile River, and uh, there was a uh, crocodile. I think there's crocodiles in the Nile. There was a crocodile coming, and I had to go get my dog. So that gives you an idea about the Nile, right? And the Egyptians were just going around to baby boys and little boys that were Egypt uh, the Israelites and just huckaming in that river. The same river that my friend wouldn't let his dog play next to. All right? So that gives you, it's not like they're like, well, my four-year-old went swimming in the Pemi. Don't think Pemi. Okay? Crocodile, Nile, don't let your dog play next to the edge of the water. Kind of a river. That's, or, yeah, four-year-old. So, these guys start, this is where we're at in this story. And Jochebed gives birth to Moses. Now, she had already had Miriam, and she was okay. She was an eight- to nine-year-old woman, a, a daughter, like I told you. But she gives birth. And this is what I think is fascinating. Well, I don't think I have it in here. I should look it up. It's really cool. It's in Genesis chapter 1. I don't think I put it in there. But in, in Exodus chapter 1... In Exodus chapter 1, okay, where's my buddy here? Where are you? Do, do, do. Actually, it's not Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 2. Did I already have it in here? Okay, right here. Exodus chapter 1, verse 2. Do I have it in there? I do. She became pregnant, gave birth to him, when she saw that he was a fine child. Is that interesting to you? That they put it in there? When she saw that he was a fine child. Now we have a ton of different translations and it's gone through a bunch. But this is, this is just Marcus's thought, okay? This is not scripture. I'm not some genius theologian or studied. I honestly what, think that what that means is that Jochebed was connected to her maker. Jochebed had a quiet time. Jochebed had a relationship with Yahweh. And in other words, you could have it translated this. Instead of saying she looked and saw that it was a fine child, right? Instead of looking and seeing, what you could have said, I think as it said, is Jochebed knew that this child was chosen by God. Right? You could think to yourself, God knew, or Jacobet knew that this child was chosen by God. And um, let's see here. Hello? No, not me. <laughs> uh, um, and that's what I love about a mother. Have you watched a mother look at their child? And I think they should. Every mother looks at their child and said, This child was chosen by God. Because they are. Every child has been made in the image of God. It's very clear in Scripture. And Jochebed, who was connected to her, her Savior, her, you know, her God, her Yahweh, knew. And if you were Jochebed, how nerve-wracking would it have been to bring this baby to your chest and see that it was a male? How nerve-wracking would that be? She had witnessed young baby boys be thrown into the Nile. This woman had heard the screams of her neighbors trying to hold on to their baby boys. And she brings this baby to her chest, and it is a boy. 
Now, this is a very anxious situation. This is great chance for depression. This is great chance for anxiety, postpartum, freak out. But Jochebed puts faith in her God, and this is what she does. Love this. One, it doesn't say anything, and this is true about even today. Did you notice when reading through Exodus chapter 2, it doesn't say anything about the dad protecting the child. Did you notice that? There is nothing in here about the dad protecting the child. And you know what's interesting? There's not a whole lot about Joseph doing much with Jesus in the light either. Some things don't change, do they? But we'll get to Father's Day in a, couple, in a month here, so that sermon's for another day. But she protected him. She protected Moses. But here's where it gets incredible. I think a mom naturally protects, right? What do all of us here in the Northeast do when we see a baby bear? What does every single person here in New England, in New Hampshire, while walking through the woods, come across a baby bear? We do this. We go, okay, where is mom? I'm just going to make some space between me and that little furry black squirrel over there. Right? We do, because we fear mom, because moms are protective. I don't want to mess with that mom, right? Human moms are the same, the naturally protective, okay? If you came into our house and you messed with the leftover Chinese food, you would fear me. You would fear me. But if you came into our house and messed with one of our kids, you would fear Heidi. Right? You fear mothers. But this is what I think is beautiful. But what happens when that protective nature turns into selfishness or turns into human thinking or turns into a a, a fleshly thing? You become a helicopter mom. You become, have you heard this one? A lawnmower parent. Have you heard of a lawnmower parent? I'm going to say it and you're all going to go, oh... A lawnmower parent is the mother or the father that goes in front of their children cutting down every obstacle in their way. Oh. (laughs) Now you got the helicopter mom and you got the lawnmower mom. When you take a God-given gift, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's communication. I don't care if it's mathematics, mechanics. I don't care if it's natural. When you take it, you take that gift and you use it under your ability, your thinking, your logic, your reason, it becomes sin. And this is a sin that is sociably acceptable. Mothers that overprotect their children. That is a socially acceptable sin. Jacobed, probably tempted, did not come to it. Because only a few like months into this kid's life did Jacobed go, Lord, this is your child. This is not mine. I only have it on loan. And she did the most incredible, crazy thing. What did she do? She went to the Nile. She put this baby in the Nile. That is insane. At least it was in a basket. (laughs) Jochebed was wise, and Jochebed was resourceful. Right? She put this baby in a basket, covering it in tar. But here's the thing: again, just like it said, he was a. She knew he was a fine child, which I think is really translated into she knew God's God's purpose for this kid. Okay, this is also a Marcusism, so I'm going to be clear about this. I really believe that Jacobed knew exactly what she was doing, where she placed Moses in the Nile. I do not think it's coincidental that the daughter of Pharaoh just. That, that Moses just happens to float to the daughter of Pharaoh. Right? She was wise. Jacobed was wise. She knew that if she placed, she didn't place Pharaoh in the docks by where the dudes all stand and talk about how big the fish was that they caught. Because what would happen if a baby basket came by a bunch of Egyptian dudes and it was crying in a baby basket? <laughs> Done. You just push it under or let it keep going. But what happens 
if the heart of a woman, what happens if the ears of a woman hear the cry of a baby? So Jochebed did not put Moses in the Nile by the docks where the boys talk about their catch. She put Moses in the reeds just outside. She couldn't get too close because if she got too close to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, where, the, where the Egyptian royalty was, I'm sure there was guards there. But she got just close enough with Miriam, who was 8 to 10 years old, to push Moses just into the royal reeds to be heard by who? Pharaoh's daughter. And if Pharaoh's daughter decides to do something with this kid, she's got clout, she's got prestige, she's got power, she's got influence, affluence. Jochebed was wise. I believe that this was a very intentional deposit into the Nile. And what's even incredible is she taught her daughter well. She knew. And here's what's amazing. Jochebed knew if she showed up as a, as, a, as, a, as a Israelite woman with this daughter, I mean with this baby, think about it. Think about the scenario. Let's say she took Miriam out of the, out of the story and Jochebed followed Moses' basket. And Pharaoh's daughter comes face to face with an Israelite mother. There is no way that, that that Egyptian daughter of a Pharaoh goes, oh, you're just some random Israelite mother that has no connection to this baby. The Pharaoh's daughter would have been like, I see what you're, no, take that baby back. But when the baby came and a nine-year-old daughter poked her head out of the reeds, Jochebed was smart, so wise. Did you hear what she says to Miriam? She goes, and when they ask for a wet nurse, tell them you've got one. She, knew, she knows what's up. She's so wise. Jochebed is connected to her Lord and Savior, to God, Yahweh, the Savior that was going to come. She was connected to her provider, her maker. She knew. He gave her wisdom. She, he gave her insight. But here's the thing. It's fun to look back on. It's unique to see. But in the moment, I bet she felt super alone. In the moment, she hid him for months in the darkness. I'm sure there was hours upon hours where she was trying to sh shush the baby. Worried. I mean, that's fear. Gripping, crippling, gut-wrenching fear of someone coming in and physically snatching that baby out of your arms. So this isn't just some pretty story that I'm telling. But Jacobed was incredible. So Miriam's like, I know someone, and goes home to mom. The plan worked, mom. She needs you to nurse Moses. Well, it wasn't Moses at the time, but she needs you to nurse my brother. So she goes, in, I'll, I'll help. Isn't it amazing? God blessed God blessed Jochebed's ability to hold her hand open to Moses' life. Now here's what's crazy about us humans. I've seen this done when God has healed children. I've seen parents come and say, Lord, I'll give anything. I'll give the child away if you just heal them. And then the Lord heals them, and what do we do? Whoop! Thank you, God. That's mine. I'll take it. I'll take it from here, God. Right? We do. It's not just moms with kids. We do it with all kinds of stuff. Ministries, careers, you know, relationships. Thanks for doing what you needed to do, God. Now I'll take it from here, right? Jacobed didn't do that. Think about this, because now she nurses the baby until he's somewhere between four and five, and then what does she have to do? She has to give him up. Lord, he's yours. I'll go back into the slums. He's going to live in royalty crazy, huh? This mother, this mother. And you know what Jacobed reminds me of, and this is so beautiful, is because one of the names of Jesus is the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah. And I like to think of Jacobed as a lioness. Because I don't know if you know much about lionesses in, in the animal kingdom. But when a lion gives birth, she takes her cub and she goes away from the pack. And she has that cub for two years. And no one can mess with the cub. No cheetah, no jackal, no um, hyena, no, no, no cobra. No, um, dude, there are some, no, no, no crocodile, no stampeding elephants. Guys, there are some gnarly predators where lionesses 
have their cubs. Right? Some gnarly ones. But guess what? There is nothing on planet Earth as powerful and protective as a lioness. Now, I know we think that the black bear is really scary, but imagine walking on a trail in New Hampshire and coming across a baby lion. I would be way more afraid. Nothing more powerful. But what happens at two years? The lioness does not become a lawnmower lioness. The lioness does not become a helicopter lioness. She takes that two-year-old cub and drop kicks it. And I mean drop kicks this thing. There's the road, pal. That was a fun two years. Mama loves you. That's the world. Get going. And I feel like that's Jacobed. She was a lioness. She protected at an incredible, it's just a mind-blowing rate, like a mind-blowing ability to protect. But she did not turn into a helicopter. She did not turn into a lawnmower. And at four to five years, she said, he's yours, God. Take him from here. Good thing she did, because what would have happened if she did this? We might not ever even know who Moses ever even was. Let me say that again. What would have happened if Jacob had said, no, he's mine, God. He gave him to me. He's my son, and I need him for my self-worth and identity. We might never even know who Moses was. God would have, would have led his people out of captivity. It's God. It would have been somebody else. But who would have been her play? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Charlton asked, who would he play? Right? <laughs> Moses was the product of a mother who trusted the Lord. Moses was the product of a mother who put her faith, hope, and love in God. And here is, I want to encourage each one of you mothers, it is never too late to trust God with your children. Because that's the lie that we like to tell ourselves and the enemy likes to tell us. Well, your kid's 35 and they still haven't chosen. So it's over. No, it's not. You're literally going to put that little faith in the God of the universe? Well, my kid's 72, or my kid's 68, or my kid's 17. Oh, boy. I don't know. 72, 16, 17. Um, it's never too late, mothers, to trust God with your motherhood. And for those in here that are not mothers... This is a hard Sunday. There are people that do not come to church on these Sundays because of how hard it is, because they are not mothers. You can trust God because you are still made in his image and you still have mother qualities even though you have not given birth. Some of the greatest female mentors are single and in their 60s and have never had children. God made female in his own image. And that is beautiful. God, we love you. We thank you for moms. We thank you for the gift that they are to the world. God, we thank you for the image that you've placed upon motherhood. Your image. It's an image that I don't have, that us men doesn't have. If we want to know more about your heart, God, if we want to know more about your strength and more about your character, we have to get to know mothers. We have to get to know the female because you have given them gifts and abilities and fingerprints on their life of you that we men don't have. Thank you so much for mothers. Thank you for Jacobed, God, and her faithfulness and her trust in you. Thank you for Moses and his, and his listening to you. So you hear me pray. Amen.
Just in his righteousness alone For this day before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Be made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm Thank you for worshiping, and I hope you all have a great Mother's Day.